Hi, Ariel. Um, thank you so much for making time to be here today. I know you've just flown in for 24 hours um, for, well, not for this conversation, but in part of this conversation. So it's great to have you. Um, and I wanted to start with doing a little bit of scene setting. Yes. I know um, you have been running your brand for nearly a decade now. You started out when the industry was not really talking about sustainability as a topic at all. And a lot has changed in the way the industry approaches that in the time. But what's changed for you? What, what have you learned in those seven years that, oh, wait, my math is bad. Well, it's, it's nine years, gonna be 10 years nine next years. year. But it's really 10 years because we we started working in the project in 2014 before we launched. But it, what the, the principles were long-term view and sustainability. And before launching, we really thought, I had a, um, a collection before that was in the contemporary world because I started from scratch. Um, and I, there was a dysfunction between what I was doing in the contemporary world and the contemporary world and market, uh, working with the department stores that wanted, you know, anyone that went through 2008, 2009 in fashion remembers this, um, discounts, yeah. uh, pushing volumes and creating this waste. And at the same time, in 2011, I, inherited my father's ranch, which was organic grass fed, which I spent all my, you know, formative years there. And it's what my family's been doing for seventh generation in pre-industrial practices. So there was a disconnect in my life. And that's when I really started to think about it. And nothing hits you like seeing climate change in the place where you've grown up. So what were you seeing on the ranch? You start to see in, in the rivers, you start to see things as more plastic. You start to see less water. There was used to be one drought every 10 years. Now there are more often. We had two consecutive droughts. I mean, two years ago, it was awful. I, was, I didn't know if I was in Uruguay, which was green, like Northern Ireland, or I was in New Mexico. So it's really, really dire. And so I love what I do, but if we were gonna do and this is my medium and this is what I'm going to do till, till I stop breathing. It's the fact that I have to do it, we have to do it better. So when you were thinking, I wanna start my own thing, mm -hmm. top of your mind was how do I do this differently and how do I do this better? And, the, and went back to what my value system is. In a ranch you think with the cycles and you think circular and you think long-term and so, you long-term view means we've had opportunities in our business to grow fast and we didn't take them. And we were happy we didn't do that. We were lucky to have hits very early on, but we decided instead of selling out, we decided to build our stores with it. And growing fast would have meant, what would you have had to sacrifice to pursue that growth? I, it would have meant, growing fast would have meant being, for example, before COVID, we were maybe 40 employees, it would have grown fast. That means we were 120 employees and it would have meant that we would have to fire 80%. And thank God we didn't because we were able to maintain. And I never, because sometimes you think, well, we did we make the good, you know, because not to cash out, to really build on it, to really build on how like, firm, consequent like growth. We've grown in the past three years over 25%. Um, I'm looking stuff to like my, my number, <laughs> my number girl. And, but to really not do that because in nature, you, if you grow really fast, if you, anything goes really fast, it comes down really fast. And so to be able to maintain the teams that we have during COVID and to really work hard during COVID and come out of a pandemic. And I was at the same time working in another uh, place and growing two companies at the right. same time. Um, with the value system that we had. So to answer your first question, the drive is the same. The learning experience, like a journey, like a practice, nobody is born knowing everything. You, you have to trial and error, try and error. But the intentions of the goals that we have of changing all our um, packaging when we were maybe 20 employees, to biodegradable cardboard hangers, to the way we uh, build our stores. Um, we were recently looking at, LVMH is an investor of ours, and we were looking at the deck 
that we shown them in 2018 and everything we promised that we were going to do, we did it. What were the key things? The way we were going to build stores, the way we were going to grow, the way we were going to stick to quality. The, but, but not, but there is no, there's not even a concession on quality. And at any point, and I think this is an interesting question, both in terms of having bought on external yeah. advisors as a, yeah you know, independent brand with a clear value definition, but also as someone who's both run their own brand and gone and, and served as creative director was for Chloe for a bit, you know, did you face pressure to sacrifice on those things? Did you face pressure to do things differently? I My value system doesn't change the, no matter where I work. So maybe they felt the pressure, but I would, you know, I the, when I arrived, people forget that it was a, a pandemic. And this is a Chloe. A Chloe. And, but I was, I was so determined that the business was in an influx and people don't change unless they need to change. Yep. So it was a perfect opportunity. You know, it was, you guys are freaking out already. <laughs> Let's do something different. Exactly. And because it's, you can't be continue doing the same yep. thing. And one of the main things that we're selling were t shirts with a logo. Yep. And this is the antithesis of what I do. So the first thing is was change all materialities. There were like 25 type of gold. You know, the galvanization process is one of the most polluting processes. So we, we don't need 25 golds. We need one gold and one silver for hardware. And, and, you know, my boss or my boss's boss will come and tell me, um, Where's the jersey? And I'm like, cashmere jersey? <laughs> and we find the, the way we find recycled cotton and we can ever to develop it. And we work with Adriano Goldschmidt that worked all his life in cotton, creating the most incredible brands of denim. And he hates cotton. And we created these uh, hemp recycled cotton denim together. And that's what's worth doing. That's what's worth pushing. And so you kind of took advantage of these moments of disruption yeah. to sort of say, well, look. You have to create hits and things that move forward. So, uh, you know, all these luxury brands, one of the, my big learning experiences, and I am so grateful of that opportunity because I learned things that I hadn't learned. Like here, you know, you see this hand crochet, you see everything that it's on the top of the pyramid, like, you know, what I was showing you with the glass beads. Yes. So, the, you know, all these luxury brands, you have the top, right? Which is the craft product. And then you have the medium, which let's say it's a tailoring piece and this, you know, recycled uh, cashmere. And then you have the volume drivers. Yeah. And those volume drivers is where I identified that needed to change really quickly. They had a, a, a tote that had the logo everywhere that was made out of um, cotton. And immediately that was changed into linen and vertical linen. And of course, you need a team and a support. So as the team, the sustainable team in Chloe was growing, so were the abilities. So we did vertical fabrics yeah. that, that was not being done before. Then we did the denim and then we did the Nama sneaker, yeah. which today is over 50% of the footwear sales. I think you're underplaying the complexity of what was involved there. Because especially if you go into a brand and you talk about those kind of mm -hmm. mass products, those are the ones that drive sales. Yeah. Those are the ones that, you know. I'm very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I'm underplaying it. It was like, the, 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 there's not a lot of, but there was, at the beginning, there was resistance in the sense of it's a learning experience. Yes. So you have to, but the, the, the business needed to change. Yeah. So there was a willingness to change. So the ingredients for change like that happened. And, and I, you know, I remember thinking, for example, how do you communicate um, during a pandemic? How do you do a first campaign? We just went from one of the most traumatic yeah. uh, experiences that has happened globally, uh, where millions and millions of people have died. And we're dealing with climate change. And, and when I saw that campaign, and I'm Latin American, and I was the first Latin American woman heading a uh, European uh, Parisian yeah. house. So I have to represent my people. <laughs> and so we had Andy with a poncho um, in a Mexico landscape. And Andy was a Mexican girl. And that was for me quite um, impactful because it meant that it was honest and, and what we believed in. And what was the response to that? 
I mean, I loved it. <laughs> I don't know what the response was, but I, one of them, if I can look back and I know that I will back to my career and look back to points where I was, I did something good was when I looked at that beautiful image of Andy, a Mexican young girl, um, top of the Louvre, right? And with everything that's happening in immigration in the yes. US, that meant a lot to me because I, I got emotional. Yeah, so and it's, it's, uh, it's it, that's why it's, I bring so much craft from where I come from to, to show people that 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 there's so much diversity that needs to be learned and knowledge, and and, knowledge. and and connecting the issues around environment to the human side as well. Yes, which people don't connect. That you're absolutely. Thank you for bringing that together because people think that all these issues that we're having right now are separate issues, but they're all interconnected. Well, and this is something else that you did at, at Chloe as well, right? You sort of looked at the supply chain and found craft people, mm -hmm. artisans who... Yeah, I just was, today was shopping with, you know, there is these Buddhas in, 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 in life that they need to be mentioned. Simone Cipriani, for example, that he were, works for the UN uh, refugee yeah. program. And he sets up basically co-ops in developing nations. And he just was texting me about one that uh, he's just done in, in, uh, in Kenya. And he goes to Mali and he goes to all these places and put, gives jobs to people and really trains them so you can, so you can produce, you know, so for example, one of the collections that we did, the Artemisia Gentileschi, which was a, a collection about women. I did four, my climate solutions ideas. We did four collections of Chloe uh, on based on those uh, concepts. And the Artemisia Gentileschi, all the, all the metal parts were done by a non-for-profit in Kenya. And it's beautiful. There's craft and handwork. And, and you're having direct impact. Yes, and, and we need to employ the workforce that is happening from uh, the displacement that's happening from climate. I think the number is going to cripple up in just in a few years to 125 million refugees and half of them are children. Um, so we need to find ways of how to integrate all of us into what we do. It's really interesting talking about this and how you've embedded it into collections consistently and, and, and the storytelling of collections, especially at a time when we're seeing um, at the fashion world writ large, mm -hmm. get a little bit more anxious about talking about things related mm -hmm. to the climate and impact. Um, you know, we're here, we're seeing a little bit more green hushing. Mm -hmm. What, what, what's your perspective on that? What, what do you think the industry's responsibility and, and, you know, potential power to communicate is. I think we spoke about this um, in the sense that I don't only see it in our industry, I see it in, in there was a whole movement with BlackRock yes. or the ESGs. And so this is the back backlash in America where you've seen finance institutions come under a lot of pressure for investing in yeah. environmental and social sustainability. So, so I think that if it's something that it looked like it was a trend <laughs> two years ago, we are in the hottest year on record. We, we're just seeing the reports of how the people need to realize that the global economy has been subsidized by our oceans. All the data points that the scientists had from first Earth date, which was 1970, it's pretty exact of what would happen if fossil fuels kept on being burned, because this is why we're here, right? Let's, let's be clear. Um, and, um, this is the only thing they miscalculated is how much heat the oceans would take for us. We wouldn't be here. Whatever we are doing externally, it's, it's happening internally to us. And the interconnectivity to other humans, to other species, to the environment, we are not separated from nature. We are nature. So it's, it's really, there's a book that I read a couple of years ago that's called We Contain Multitudes, which is about also the internal extinction that we're going through our own microbes that have been with us through the development of our species and we're losing them too. Yes. So, <laughs> so, but again, I said this before, we're not a suicidal species. We have to change. And I think the opportunity to change is happening right now. And it's unfortunately 
and suffering will continue and we will need to that's why I think standing to the values that matter today, because we're going to be all judged. At the end of the day, when I go to bed, I feel that I'm doing everything I can for my kids to say, my mom was out there trying to do something. In that context, yeah. I want to go back to the question yeah. of growth, because yeah. that's one of the big challenges facing any industry yeah. now. How do you grow? How do you grow responsibly? And how do you do that without increasing impact? You have to, as again, there is how much greed, right? What's the growth? What's the excess? And I am more interested in efficiency. Is my, are we making cash? Is it efficient, right? Who cares if it's a billion dollars, two billion dollars, if it's not making money, we're just wasting. So efficiency. I mean, I wasn't growing up in this model. I, I, I grew up, you know, in, in South America, you don't grow up with taking loans. You know, you, you can't, can't afford it, you can't afford it. You can't buy a house. You can't, you know, you just have right. to build with what you have. And so this mentality of paying the bill later, it's, it's something from, from that's a, a new knowledge. Yes, so that growth-oriented business model where you, you spend today on the basis of sales tomorrow, yeah. that and isn't it, really compatible. Exactly, and life being dictated by the markets. Which is a big part of the way yeah. the industry's business model works yeah. today. And it's interesting when you talk about efficiency because the way that's interpreted in the yeah. traditional model is how do you produce at scale at the cheapest price? Yes, which, and again, that cheapest price has a cost that someone else is paying now and in the future. And so who's picking up the bill? I remember as CEO of a, of a large publicly traded company in our industry, you know, uh, talking to- No me. names. <laughs> no names. But you know, they, 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 you know, when you're a smaller business, they like to talk, talk to you like they're big shots. And, um, and he said, we produce, I don't know what crazy number over, 100,000 products this year, da, 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 da. We made 100,000 products. I'm like, how much did he sell? Yeah. You know? Yes. That's the question. And it's very interesting how reluctant yeah. the industry as a whole has been to disclose numbers around that. Yeah. It's not Making a, and selling, not, not the, the same, same thing. thing. <laughs> not the same thing. One other point that we've discussed before is is pricing. You know, yeah. people often talk about you know, sustainable fashion. It's going to be so expensive because yeah. it's moving to from a model that's very efficient and cheap to potentially one that isn't, um, and therefore it's it's sometimes characterized as being elitist. What, what's your perspective on that? I think that I grew up in what I find a quality environment that wasn't ostentatious. Right? It was a ranch. Things had to be made good to last. It's functional. Functional. Uh, my mother had a small wardrobe, if maybe two thirds of that rack, and she didn't go buy clothes because that's not what you you did. Every so often, not every year, every so often, because they're not nice stores. But the nicest thing you could do at that time was buy fabrics and make them with your seamstress. Yeah. But she had beautiful made-to-measure clothes. That, and if anyone that's from a rural background understands what I'm talking about, when you work in the land and you work in a ranch, when you clean up, you clean up nicely. <laughs> it's like there's a pride to clean up. You know? It's like you're very presentable and you, you take pride on being clean and, um, and well-dressed. And so it was, I still have this fascination with these pieces. I mean, I made my first suit based on my mother. I think quality doesn't have to be sacrificed. Maybe quantity has to be sacrificed. Maybe you should have less of some, of, but maybe have better quality. I've always said I'd rather have one good sweater and my clients have one good sweater and I promise them that I'm giving them the best quality I can get my hands to um, versus 10. Right. And you can do that at different price points yeah, as well. Yeah. You can mm -hmm. have something mass market that's yeah. at a much lower price point, but of an excellent quality. Exactly. And there's, as I said, there's ways to do 
even those volume drivers better. The, this, you know, sneakers, I've done it, we worked eight months on these sneakers that we measured the life cycle compared to the previous sneakers and it saved 85% more water. What were the key levers there? Recycled polyester, water, uh, soluble glue. And that was the main ingredient. No new, no new petroleum-based product. How much opportunity do you see in efforts to, to innovate within the industry? You know, recycle. A lot. <laughs> A lot. Other specific areas that you're looking at. I think that we're going to have to. We're moving in this direction that is inevitable, right? And it's not. Again, I'm, I like to compare things to outside of our industries. Our phones have recycled materials in it now. Um, because mining for new copper is cheap. It's cheaper to use recycled than mining new for copper. So a lot of things are making economical sense that are also making environmental sense. So I think we're moving into a direction that we are going to have to have complete verticality and transparency on where things are coming from. Where did this crop come? Where did this come to the end product? This is why even if we're a small company, we, we, chose during COVID to digitalize all the, all the... You've got the product passports. Yes. So you can see where everything yes. comes from. And then the next step is recycle. What do you think it's going to take to get the industry there? Because even this year... The big seen, guys, the big guys. And I think there are some that are very... That are moving in that direction. Yes, yes. But it seems very hard because this year we've seen already, you know, just this morning we we're talking about there's been a big investigation into cotton coming from Brazil that yeah. isn't traceable, is contributing to deforestation. Um, some of the luxury brands have gotten into trouble for what's going on in their supply chains. It's happening at every price point. Um, and you don't see huge shifts in the way companies are operating. You know, what do you think it's going to take? I think there's honestly some truly easy solutions, which is get some of those small, I mean, I get inundated. Sometimes I wish I had a bigger company just to hire all these brilliant brains that are out, out there. Young people that are so motivated to work for purpose. People don't just want a job right now. They know where it's coming. Hire these really capable brains, have very strong, sustainable teams, and that will push you to have the accountability. You know, they yeah. push and listen to them. Because they are, they are some of these issues that you are talking about, uh, about transparency, sometimes they're not ill intent, are right. just not. Like there's the middleman, that the middleman, and they don't know them. It's the lack of complete transparency. You know, somebody really going and So looking. you need to have the people who you can go and do that. The, exactly. And then you need to listen to them when they yes. come to you and say, hey, we, yes. should, we should deal with this thing. This is, this is a red flag. This is an orange flag. Yeah. Going to get a red flag. Like, let's do this right now. And complete accountability. And of course, regulation is coming, but um, we can't wait. Yeah, you have to move before that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about um, your experience being you know, a, a leading female creative in the industry. You know, there aren't that many women who've been creative directors at big brands, mm -hmm. you, even fewer now than there were just a few years ago. Like, wh why do you think that is? I mean, I thought about this, right? And I, and I think that, again, I don't know if there's an ill intention. We talked with Steph about this because she went through the transformation in the finance industry where there was an actual the majority were male, male dominated workforce. And there was an actual intent to change that. Right. And there was execution on that. And I think that maybe this is like the unproven Gavi theory, right? So, you know, in quotes, but if you think about it, if you're a man of a certain generation that grew up in a certain city with all these different media and communication kind of you know, telling you women, men, this is the identity, this is the archetype, the information. Are you more comfortable talking business with a masculine face in front of you? Sure. That's where I think it's a, maybe a subconscious bias that can happen, but that doesn't mean that cannot change. Um, but I think it's across the board. You know, I, I, I just think women need to be, for. I am an absolute 100% believer that 
women need to be in power positions in order to change. Every time I go to a meeting for something and it's all women, I'm like, oh, we're going to get things done. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> like things are going to happen. We're going to move things forward. Yeah, it's because it, there's something about us that we are really administrative, operational, and all of this is data recorded. Like you look at uh, countries that have supported women, the economists have done better. You look at women in catastrophes, they try to save more than themselves. You look, you empower community, empower women, they empower communities. I know this data from Manos del Uruguay. I know this data from Save the Children. You empower women, you empower communities. It's incredible what women are capable to do. And, um, in, from an administrative, executive, uh, even creative position. So, uh, female leadership is extremely needed right now. I think it's really interesting how you've approached that too, because you've, taken this across many different facets. Obviously you run your own brand, but you know, you've also become, you know, you're with Save the Children and you're also operating a lot in, in spheres that most people in fashion don't move into. You've, you've talked to COP about nuclear fusion for heaven's sake. Um, you know, how do you think about how you can take your role and your position and use that to, you know, further the impact that, you know, you were saying is so central to. I, I think that I have to maximize. You do what you do, not for recognition, but for a sense of duty, right? And that's, and I know what's happening. And I know uh, it's, I am someone that, someone that moves towards what they are scared of. Not some people, their brain paralyzes them and that's the way they're wired. You know, I probably was like the crazy hunter and gatherer actually going, you know, towards the beast. Like, I don't know why I'm like this, but the reason I, I see something um, from a different perspective and it makes sense to me. The time I saw the article about fusion was o October of 2021 and my brain just went like, Bruh! Wait, and just to back up for yeah. a minute, explain, explain fusion. Okay. So... I will say, start with fission, which is what no people call uh, nuclear. I have nothing against nuclear. I think we could be using clean, abundant energy, but I'll back up even more. So right now we have over 80% of our world moving on fossil fuels. This is the main reason why the world is warming up. So we are extracting um, Basically, oil, gas, coal. <laughs> yes, yes. We're, tr we're extracting uh, dead things from another geological time, burning them up, shooting them out to the atmosphere. And we think that's a good idea, but because it's efficient, most of the turns that humanity has done is because it was kind of easy. You know, not evil, but just it was easy. Yeah. And so, this idea, the same idea of why do we have styrofoam? It brings you cancer and it w will live here forever. We still have it. Yeah. So back to f the fossil fuels, the world moves most of it on fossil fuel. The world is not going to consume less energy. This is absolutely not like not a concept. And why us in the developing world? Because there's the notion of us here in London. Yeah. But we have to think of the people in the tropics. Yeah. Every day I think about the people living in the tropics. I, I you know, I, it's, you see Dune, th that's a reality. Yeah. That's a reality where I've seen women having, again, women, huh, having to dig eight hours in dry riverbeds yeah. to get a little bit of water. That's the day activity. When there is nothing, when your everything has died, your livestock, yeah. I mean, it's terrifying. And so why can't they have infrastructure? Why can't yes. they have hospitals? You wanna see creative geniuses? Go look at all the NGO uh, logistic peoples that are working in countries without infrastructures. They are, I mean, amazing people, geniuses. So the world is moving on fossil fuels. We have the intermittent energies here, which we love. And that's renewables. Yeah. Wind power, solar. That's sometimes the wind blows, sometimes the sun shines, yeah. sometimes it doesn't, so yeah. it's intermittent. And so we can't, this, they can't take this capacity. Then we have here nuclear, hydrogen, and fusion, hopefully in the commercial. Nuclear, I have absolutely nothing against nuclear. It just has bad PR. Yes. But what I love about fusion is the fact that it doesn't use uranium. While it's not in a commercialized state yet, it has a lot of uh, 
prospect. And the article that you read that got you excited about this, this was when there was a breakthrough that showed that for the first time... No, 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 no the breakthrough was later. Oh, that's why, so this was that's, before the breakthrough. That's, yeah, that's why Steph calls me the Oracle of Paysandu, <laughs> because it was before. It was before the breakthrough. The, the breakthrough was December of last year. And so the, and that breakthrough was that for the first time yeah, the Lawrence, yeah. you were able to um, generate more energy than was required yes. to be put in. And exactly. Energy. And so it was, I saw an article uh, in the Financial Times that talked about the investment that was happening in fusion on private companies. Because business is business, right? And if there's a model and a scale model, and that's when I understood talking to the different fusion companies. I talked to Alan Eustas, which was one of the designers of Google Earth, and he's in the board of Commonwealth Fusion System. And he said at the beginning, you know, I was, you know, trying to get people in the board and investing. And, but then when I realized that it was a scale issue, that energy is a scale issue, that there is money to be made, then there was a model. And that's when I started to get hopeful. So when I started to look that people will make money on this, right? I was like, because it's clean energy, right. which has, it comes from um, uh, the ones that I've looked at, for example, use deuterium and tritium, which is two isotopes of hydrogen. We're mostly made out of, uh, of, of hydrogen. Fusion is the, is the power energy of the universe. It's the, it's the stars. So basically it's creating stars in this planet. And there's, for the tokamak technology, there's 150 tokamaks right now. I visited the private sector ones uh, and public sector ones. Um, I visited JET, which is in the UK. That do people don't know, but in Coulomb, Oxford was uh, the hottest place in the in the universe in the in the galaxy uh, when the tokamak would go on. They just uh, dismantled JET. It was created in started created in 1976, so yeah. it's been going around for a while. But now it's having a momentum because of the private investment. But it's going to be the idea is that these reactors will be able to go in directly to the, the coal plants and going to the grid. Right. So this is a technology that we've been imagining for decades. Decades. Um, and has, I think, isn't the joke that it's always been 20, 30 years yes. away yes. and you never, you never get closer. Yes. But for example, um, Commonwealth Fusion System, again, I'm not an investor, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a politician, so I can speak as a person and as a mother that really believes this, we're very close and that this technology can truly save our asses. And um, when I speak to the chief of Tokamak at uh, Commonwealth Fusion System, Alex Creedy, genius, genius. I mean, he's a literal nuclear scientist. Yes, <laughs> but they're geniuses. I mean, when I'm these young, brilliant brains that chose to be here for climate, use their brilliance. I just want to, that's why I invited them all to our Chloe Fusion show. That's why they always come to our shows because they need to be paid attention. I go to speak to cops. I mean, the second day with my friend, the chef, the Fusion, which actually is going to save us, is that they're on the seventh day. Yeah. Tell me more about what those experiences are like, because one of the things that yeah. I always find interesting about talking about topics mm -hmm. related to sustainability and fashion is yeah. the fashion industry are having these conversations and they are not plugging in to conversations that are happening at the UN at a policy level. Yeah. And they're not plugging into you know, science convers you know, that individ yeah. individually, yes, yeah. but as an industry. So what has it been, you know, how have you made your way into these spaces and how have you found it you know, being introduced to those sides of the world and introducing, you know, nuclear scientists and politicians to your fashion world. It's it's extremely exciting because first of all, everyone wants to come to a fashion show. So <laughs> you will have, you know, uh, you will have politicians, you will have scientists, you will have different people. I like to, br you have NGOs. You, I like to bring people together and the sense of beauty brings people together. But even in the journey of fusion has been so incredible from being, literally like looked at like, what are you talking about? To the breakthroughs, to launching with uh, John Kerry in in uh, COPS in Dubai, the first international fusion program, the, thinking in, in like larger scales of like, this is actually Ernest Muniz, which is was our former um, uh, deputy uh, secretary of energy. He was, um, 
he wasn't in the US. In the US, he wasn't a, a fusion uh, believer. Like, and now he's actually introducing me to go to see fusion companies. So the, it's changing because we need it. And this is the beauty about human ingenuity. When we put our focus and our creativity and our effort and the money, because when people say, "Oh, it's so," what's the ex- cost of fusion? Right, the experiments and. But how much are we spending per day? And what's wars? the cost not to do it? Exactly. But this is what they say. This is why the scientists say it's too. The chance of it is too good to not even try, even if we fail. Right. It is just such a like you just have to go for it. And I think it's really interesting listening to you talk about it. Um, how empowering it is to bring people together. I think you know often in the sustainability space, mm-hmm. it can feel like a constant battle. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to move things forward and you're fighting the status quo and there's a lot of burnout, a mm-hmm. lot of exhaustion. Um, but from what you're, what you're talking about doesn't sound like that, it sounds hopeful. Well, because you, you, we need, I'm just one catalyst of many catalysts in different industries that are awoken to their reality, right? That decided, you know, this is what, the mission is and I'm in for the mission and let's go do it, you know? And so I do think that it's just about bringing these catalysts together and these like-minded people. Sometimes CEOs of big companies, they have, they, they have, they are concerned about, you know, the public persona, what, what it's going to, like the perception. A lot of them are actually doing things and not talking about it, right? which is actually a good thing. But at this point, it's good to be, start to be more transparent about what's going on. Right, and I think also one of the things that is difficult for anyone who um, is, is in that executive level is that, that you know this is a messy process. Mm-hmm. There's no one right answer, but I think it's, it seems that not talking about it makes it harder yes. because then you, you don't have that conversation. You don't have people Telling, saying how they found solutions. I, you know, I, I like to use the example of, of September 11 because all the intelligent community, intelligence agencies in the world were not really communicating to each other. But after September 11, there was a much bigger work together. And it's proven the fact that there's more efficiency if we work together. And I think that being open source, being able to, to talk about it, uh, a lot of the fusion, uh, uh, different private companies are quite transparent about their technologies and sharing. Right? Maybe this magnet thing we're using here, you can use it there. And there's a lot of other off, of, uh, off shifts that happen through the, the scientific experiment. They're having beams that are being used to, for oncology or even saving um, how to manage battery saving because a lot of it is how to manage energy. But the scientific project it, process is also messy. The creative process is also messy. The road is always m- messy, but uh, we don't have another option. Do you see lessons from this that you could take and bring back to the fashion industry? Yes, all the time. I, I think I, again, I love what I do and I feel that I have the responsibility to not only do a product that my clients love and thank God for that because we can continue doing that, but to also learn and move forward. Because as I said, these are the values of the company. So if it's stop being long-term view and it's stop being uh, sustainable, then we're not here. So it's, it's, it's what I believe in, company and person. I think that's a really powerful note and a really important point to end on. So thank you, Gabby. Thank you for taking this time um, and being here today. And I really look forward to seeing where this goes and, and what you do next. Thank you.